Hello, everybody. It's Tuesday afternoon, and uh, Dr. K and me, Gil, are here to uh, do our usual Tuesday afternoon webinar and give hey, you a clue, or at least try to uh, figure out what's going on with, on with this market. I think the big question for everybody right now, and, and this is something that seems to dominate the media as well, is uh, what is happening with QE2? Is that going to come to an end? And how does that affect the markets? Uh, there's one thing I noticed. Everybody can see this NASDAQ chart here uh, on my screen. Yes, very good. Okay. I'm going to assume that everybody can. Let's go back to when QE1 ended. And everybody remembers this uh, back in uh, late April, early May of last year. You know, the market was trending very nicely, very evenly uh, after making a loan in early February and coming straight up looking like it was just going to keep charging higher. And then QE1 ended, and of course the market collapsed. You had the flash crash on this day, May 6th. And we went through a summer correction until we started getting inklings of QE2, at which point the market started to discount that by following through on September 1st, which I believe was uh, right here. It's on the chart right here. Uh, where you have follow through date, started a new bull run. And this was anticipating the uh, arrival of QE2 in early November, which actually was here. Notice when QE2 actually started in early November, you actually got a little correction and the market took off again into December and into January and February. And by the time we hit the end of February, we started to get into this choppy environment, which is what we're in now. So, you know, if the Fed is looking at ending QE2, all they have to do is look back at the chart of last April, May uh, 2010, to see what happens when they just pull the rug out on the markets uh, and end their QE cycle. So in this case, QE2, last time in April, May of 2010, it was QE1. So they saw that the markets kind of came unglued. You had that flash crash day, which unnerved a lot of people and, of course, gave uh, all the regulators and the government a reason to start investigating people for, quote, causing that. Uh, but I think it just showed what happens when they just kind of pull the rug out. Here you kind of see the market as opposed to April of 2010, since February, since late February on the chart here. You can see we've been in this very choppy, choppy uh, mode, and it's very hard to make progress. Some stocks will work and, and be very choppy on the upside. Netflix is a great example of that. That stock has been very choppy yet, continues to make new highs and made another all-time high today, I believe. So the question becomes, what happens when QE2 ends. Is the market going to end up like it did at the beginning of May 2010 when QE1 ended? Uh, I think if the Fed has any brains, which you know, of course is debatable, I'll admit that, uh, they're probably not going to let the same thing happen. Now they may pull QE2 out uh, and, and end it, but they're still going to be reinvesting uh, principal payments from the Treasury bonds that they hold on their balance sheet and the other bonds that they hold on their balance sheet, such as mortgage bonds and whatnot. Uh, so there is still going to be this floating sort of liquidity uh, as they maintain their balance sheet. When Dr. K and I debate this constantly, but my view right now is that what we're seeing demonstrated by the U.S. government, I think as well as the global, uh, the sovereigns globally, particularly in Europe, is a sort of disdain for cutting spending or really dealing with the reality of this uh, tsunami of debt that the world is currently under for the most or at least the developed economies and uh, I think what what you're seeing is that there's not going to be any spending cuts there's not going to be any uh, approach towards solving the problem that has anything to do with reining in spending or dealing with it in that manner you're looking at two options now as I see it and I was on Fox News this morning uh, with Stuart Barney and I said quite frankly I think that you're looking at two options default or devalue and that means default in other words either restructure the debt which in my view is tantamount to defaulting if you have to change the terms of the debt that you have uh, or you devalue your currency so I think no matter what happens even if QE2 ends there's going to be some sort of QE uh, that uh, comes on after uh, QE2 ends so somebody's asking where are the graphs you should be able to see them on your screen everybody else can uh, in any case, Dr. Hay, what's your what's your take on that uh, right now as far as what I just said? Yeah, well, um, after QE2 ends, the Fed can continue a soft version of QE, 
a stealth version, which is essentially uh, will have them reinvesting the proceeds from uh, the maturing securities that they've issued. So in other words, they can still help support the market by doing that, and then uh, eventually, once that is exhausted, and, and this process would probably take three to six months uh, from the end of June, once that process has exhausted itself, that at that point, there is going to be uh, an organic shrinkage of its of its balance sheet because there's no method they have to support the market at that point. Now that that's going to be interesting to see how the market reacts once uh, its balance sheet do, sheet does shrink. And I, I mean, obviously, they're going to be watching it very carefully. And my bet is that if the market were to start selling off pretty heavily uh, due to due to the lack of any sort of QE stealth or otherwise. The Fed would kick in a QE3 at that point. So one way or the other, we're going to see a market that is going to get support by the Fed one way or another through the, either the devaluation of the dollar or what the Fed is hoping for. They're hoping for a soft landing where in the uh, inflation rates um, start to increase uh, as a sign that the economy really is picking up. And since interest rates are so low, they'll have, they're hoping that they'll have headroom to in, increase interest rates, to rein in inflation, um, and, and that increase of interest rates would be a sign that the economy really is gaining traction. Uh, this also pre presupposes, though, that the market doesn't sell off when we don't go into some sort of uh, correction uh, of some magnitude. So, so, Dr. K, in other words, what you're saying here is that the Fed, if the Fed can engineer a soft landing with QE2, then all may be well with the world, and you may see uh, the economy take off and take the hand off from the Fed, which has been trying to make up for the collapse in uh, demand uh, by pumping the system with liquidity. So what do you think the chances are, given the Fed's historical record of uh, achieving soft landings, even without massive stimulus and massive uh, monetary uh, stimulus, do you, re do you really think they can achieve a soft landing uh, at this time, given the, the magnitude of what they've done relative to uh, easings in, in the past and their track record with respect to uh, achieving soft landings? Do you really think they can juggle everything just right so that they'll uh, simply hand it all off to the economy and everything will be fine and they'll be raising interest rates uh, soon and all will be well with the world? Well, if I had to put a percentage probability on it, and, and just to be blunt here, I'd say, you know, we're talking less than 2%. Just because they're late to the curve. They relate to the curve to increase rates. They relate to decrease rates. And I think they're going to be late here once again to increase rates to rein in inflation. And if you let inflation get away from you, it's a very dangerous situation for the country. I wouldn't be surprised to see that occur uh, in the next uh, year or two, year or two um, given their track record. So. Uh, it's in either case, you know. I think I think uh, that the uh, safe havens and the opportunity that exists in the market uh, over the longer term is going to probably be focused in gold and silver, and uh, maybe uh, some of the some of the commodities out there as well. So then, the way that we would look at this then in terms of probabilities, okay, QE two ends. Uh, that's going to take some period of time, and the Fed will have to organically uh, reduce their balance sheet over, say, three to six months. At the same time, they'll be trying to achieve a soft landing uh, by virtue of being able to hand everything off to a growing economy and we're starting to raise interest rates. But your take is that they're, regardless of whether they, whenever they do start to raise interest rates, they're going to be behind the curve with respect to inflation, which should benefit precious metals and commodities. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and uh, the Fed futures markets currently are pricing in a uh, Fed rate hike in early 2012. So given where everything stands right now, that's, that's what they're seeing. Now the Fed wants to see that indeed they would have to increase rates in early 2012 simply because the economy has gained traction. That's the hope. And like I said, I, I think uh, that the Fed's hope, uh, maybe they should be fearing instead of hoping because they're yeah. making all the wrong moves right now uh, to secure a soft landing as much as I'd, yeah. we'd all like to see one. So then we see a decent probability if they do end QE2 and start raising rates that they're behind the curve and we see inflation which would be good for 
uh, the precious metals and commodities. Conversely, if they continue with some sort of stealth QE3, then we might expect that this would also be beneficial to precious metals and commodities, detrimental to the dollar. And what about stocks? What happens to stocks? Well, star stocks being um, hard assets in, in of one form uh, should continue to do like they've been doing. I mean, since March of 2009, the market has more or less gone up. Uh, with the exception of, of May 2010 when uh, QE number one ended. So uh, I think that in that kind of scenario where the Fed continues to devalue the dollar, I think that just makes it makes U.S. equities uh, worth that much more because they're pegged to the dollar. Okay, so I think we're pretty much on the same page as far as that goes. And I would even say that today's action in the market, and you're looking at the chart of the daily chart of the NASDAQ composite index right here, and you can see we had a big push in volume today. We had a lot of upside volume. Fourth day of a rally, the NASDAQ was actually up, uh, what was it, 1.37%. And right now, Dr. K, what are you looking for as a minimum uh, increase percentage-wise for a follow-through day or for a buy signal? Right, we just missed it today. Uh, we're 0.03 percent off. We need 1.4 percent on the Nasdaq or 1.3 percent on the S&P. And uh, that said, I'm uh, running some uh, of my screens here. I just want to see how the market shaped up overall at the close, and also how leading stocks have performed. Uh, since simply because the model's not going to go on a buy signal, but uh, because we just didn't make that percentage threshold, and also there's no reason for a buy signal right now uh, given given the action of the overall market. However, it is on a sell signal and it might switch to a neutral uh, either today or potentially tomorrow. I'd have to, I have to look at uh, the after uh, market action, uh, rather the action that take, took place basically over the last couple hours which seemed pretty pretty interesting and critical. Right, so we'll await your conclusions there. Hopefully you'll have them before the end of the hour uh, and we can uh, discuss them here on this webinar. So the way we're looking at the market right now, uh, people, is that you're got, you've got some decent action in the indexes. It's a rally. You're in a choppy phase here. You're still in a very difficult market, so it doesn't strike us as optimal to be playing heavily here. And there aren't really a lot of setups that we like either way. Uh, things start to work one way, and then they seem to kind of give way or not really follow through. But there are things acting constructively, just whether there's a big window of opportunity uh, where you're going to be able to make a lot of money, similar to how we were able to score pretty well with silver, uh, really in a couple of months uh, this year to be up 49% um, uh, uh, gross ourselves uh, for the year, year to date. Uh, you know, we're just waiting around for something like that. We don't feel that we have to be in there uh, trying to build up positions to get big in this market and take a stand one way or another. You know, sometimes the market's black or white, and sometimes it's gray, and most of the time it can be gray in certain periods and I think that's what you're looking at here and I think the chart of the NASDAQ here attests to that and so we have to take that into account but to me what the action tells me even though it's choppy and sloppy is that QE2 yes is coming to an end but something is going to replace it and whatever is coming down the pike is going to be somehow related to the monetization or restructuring of debt and I think globally that's going to happen. You know, Europe can throw money at Greece, I think, for, for only so long. I don't know if they can continue that forever. Can the Fed continue to be buying 70% of the treasuries that are issued every time we have a treasury auction? I mean, if you think about it, if the Fed has to go out there and buy 70% of uh, the treasuries offered in any auction, and we have a AAA rating, then really we only have 30% uh, of a AAA rating. So I think that's a lot closer to a single A rating. Because uh, without the Fed, you don't have very much demand for the Treasury, but it, but they can continue to play that game and all they're doing is printing money uh, either figuratively or literally, uh, mostly figuratively and just adding zeros to accounts here and there and moving things around uh, on paper uh, to create this, uh, to basically create more money. And so what you're seeing is the money stock, in fact I read last night that uh, the money stock has increased 30 percent over the last five months and that this is going to either lead to heavy inflation or, or just a continued devaluation of the dollar, uh, which of course is going to be positive in the short term at least for stocks and long term definitely for precious metals. So 
you know, what we're seeing here, today's action seems to confirm that view, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be making a lot of money in stocks. However, what we like here, and the only thing that we have been playing, the only thing that we are long as of this very second, is uh, a position in the double, the DGP, the double gold shares. Let me switch charts here, since that is a NASDAQ chart. Uh, with NASDAQ volume, here's one with uh, the regular volume. But you can see we have had gold uh, break down off the peak along with silver, held a 50 day. We got a buy signal here on May 20th, and it has moved steadily upward. Now it may back and fill for a while and go sideways, but our take is that we've probably seen your lows in gold, you've probably seen your lows in silver, and while they may be choppy from here, our guess is that they're going to continue higher over the foreseeable future over the next few months as uh, this QE2 thing settles out and, and shifts and transforms into something else that is really not going to ne negate the amount of money printing that is going on out there. And that's pretty much how we see it. It's just the, the, the U.S. government, uh, basically the politicians refuse to, to look at the situation uh, realistically and they certainly won't allow themselves to lose votes by cutting uh, the benefits and the entitlements that their constituents get. We saw that in New York last week on Tuesday. A Republican seat was lost in the House uh, in upper upstate New York uh, in what was previously a Republican stronghold on the basis that the Republican plan, or at least Representative Ryan's plan, which is considered more a Tea Party plan, is going to throw Grandma off the cliff and uh, take away everybody's Medicare benefits, even though that is not true because anybody who's read the bill knows that anyone over 55 is not going to have anything touched as far as Medicare goes. So that's that none of that's true, but it does show how the voters can be influenced to just vote for the same old thing, which results in the same old approach to these budget deficits, which is keep on borrowing and keep on spending. And all that's going to do is continue to de debase the dollar and send uh, precious metals and commodities higher. So we prefer gold right now simply because you have that reference, but the bottom line is that if gold continues higher, silver is going to be dragged along with it. Dr. K, what do you prefer owning right now, gold or silver, and which do you think has more potential for an acceleration to the upside from here? Well, historically gold uh, is less volatile than silver, so in, in essence when gold gets, gets moving in one direction, silver tends to outperform uh, in either direction, whether you're you're going long or short silver, and uh, the thing about silver right now is that it just uh, had a uh, intermediate term top here, so it's liable to be a bit sloppy in its trade, and because of that sloppiness, if someone were to invest in silver, they're they're more liable perhaps to get uh, whipped out of the position, whipped sought out um, in that kind of choppy uh, trading nature that silver can can have, especially given where it's at right now. So uh, I prefer gold. Um, I actually have a position in silver and I'm looking to pyramid into um, higher position, higher prices in silver. But it's a small position and, and uh, I, I also like gold. I have a position in that and uh, I think that either one is viable. I use gold as sort of the bellwether here to guide, uh, to guide my viewpoint on how healthy or unhealthy precious metals are acting and I like what I see in gold. Yeah, I, I do too. I think those might work. Uh, you know, we've gotten some questions, and, and uh, you know, I don't like to slam anybody, but I, I really think people aren't really paying attention to what's going on on the website when they think that the portfolio simulator needs to be long gold. If we say we're long gold, if we're personally long gold, that's because we are. The portfolio simulator is basically the follow the stock feature on the website, and the intent of the portfolio simulator is not to follow the market direction model, it's not to follow my account, and it's not to follow Dr. K's account. What it is, therefore, is just to show how somebody who's taken a very simple approach to the market might come into a, a new bull market, start to take some positions, and try to build them. Now, we only started that in December, and so we really haven't had the kind of environment where it's been very simple to try and build positions. But the portfolio simulator is simply a portfolio where we try to take the role of somebody who has a day job and they may not be able to watch the market all day every day uh, and they may not have a lot of time to devote to the market uh, because maybe they have a real job and they got to spend most of their time doing that and that's what the portfolio simulator does okay so right now the portfolio simulator is in cash because our view is that unless 
you have a lot of time to spend on the market, then you shouldn't be messing around in the market right now. Okay, just because the market direction model says buy or sell doesn't mean that some guy who's got a day job needs to be jumping into the market 100 or 200 percent in. And since we're able to watch the market, we can watch the nuances and what's going on with silver and gold. We're quite willing to take a position in gold here. However, that may have higher risk and it may not have as much reward uh, in the short term or we may have to sift through a lot of volatility. Okay, but everybody's getting all this crossed up thinking the portfolio simulator has to do the same thing that the market direction model has to be doing or or what Dr. K and I are doing in our own accounts. And they're, they're not related. So people stop trying to put them all together into this one thing that all runs one one way all the time and runs all together, all right? Uh, so it's really not relevant. If, if a guy who has a day job, you know, we think there's a position where gold is in where uh, someone who has a day job could come in and, and take a position in gold and just kind of hang on to it using a simple stop. Uh, we would do that right now, but we think the situation could be volatile, and we don't think that the portfolio simulator needs to be in the market given what it's supposed to achieve. Market direction model is something else. That's simply a pointer telling you where we think the optimal direction of the market is in the short term uh, in terms of trying to ride a longer term trend. Now that can shift back and forth over a period of time within a couple of weeks, uh, and so that you know that's another thing altogether. So so please don't get them all like they all have to be in aligned together, moving in the same direction and buying the same thing. So if we say we like gold, that means well why isn't the portfolio simulator in gold? Just think a little bit, please. That's all we're asking. And I don't mean to be rude, but uh, it gets, I think it gets a little bit silly after a while. In any case, I think. Uh, Gold and silver look like they may back and fill in here for a while, but we think you've seen the lows. We've taken a position, but we're only going to add to gold, and I'm sure Dr. K in his silver position is only going to add to silver if it moves higher. And Dr. K, do you add to these positions on weakness or strength? Well, I prefer to add on strength. In other words, on a price basis, the instrument, the ETF, has to prove itself. And so if it hits that price point, then I'm going to add to the position. <laughs> oh, there's some funny questions coming up. Uh, no, we don't look at palladium, but we do look at gold and silver. The bottom line is a lot of these precious metals will correlate, so why not play the most liquid ones, which would be gold and silver? Um, so that's, that's kind of how we look at it. And anyways, let's look at some stocks, okay? There were some interesting things today. Uh, on the long side, Apple uh, just missed a pocket pivot. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days. It's got to, it had to exceed this volume here, which totaled out at what? Uh, looks like uh, 16 million 067 here. And today we traded uh, 14 million 780. So not enough volume on this 10th day out for this to be a pocket pivot buy point. And it's not a viable gap up either. And it, it did occur on news that Steve Jobs is going to be announcing Apple's iCloud service where they're going to be uh, allowing people to use uh, cloud storage space for their music collection and access it from any sort of device uh, that, that can do that. And I think that makes a lot, a lot of sense. I have an iPad. I have an iPod. And I can't kind of intermingle my uh, music collection between the two. Using this new service that they have, I could access my music collection via my iPad or my iPod without actually having to store it on the iPad or the iPod, which I think is, is a very smart idea given where they're at with their products and the different array of uh, products that they have or devices that they have. So in the stock, this move today is constructive in that you had increasing volume and you popped back above the 50-day moving average. You know, maybe this is telling you that the market wants to go higher and Apple will be leading the charge. So that, that actually looks pretty good. If you look at some of the other big NASDAQ stocks, Amazon is holding this 190 level right here, which is where it broke out from. I actually would use a trend line uh, breakout level, so that would be closer to 186. For me, I could see it pulling back down there, and that would actually coincide right now with the 50-day moving average, which is this blue line right here. Okay, so... But right now, what you're seeing is actually holding up better than that. It comes in and tests the 190 level. You came down, undercut this little low from a little over two weeks ago. And so three days ago, you came down here, which undercut this prior low here. 
kind of setting up a little bounce. You know, Amazon may need to go sideways. If the market starts to pick up some momentum to the upside, which I would not be surprised if it did, uh, you may start to see some of these uh, move out. You know, Baidu also is trying to form a low. This may turn out to just be a base, so we keep an eye on this. A lot of these stocks, though, if they do come out, you're going to start to see pocket pivots. So we do like Molly Corp. You know, somebody's asking if Dr. K uh, owns it again. Uh, but Not you did yet. have a – what's that? Not yet. I'm watching it very carefully for uh, a uh, logical uh, pocket pivot point. After What I like right. about Molly Corp chart, actually, is if you – if you go back to the beginning, it's very clean. It's a very clean chart, and when you do get that pocket pivot, it uh, it usually works quite well. And so I'm going to wait and have the patience just to just to sit. And it's, my guess is it's probably going to base out here and then form something relatively constructive, and then issue some sort of pocket pivot like it's done before. Right. And today looks like a pocket pivot. You'll notice the volume level is higher than any down volume over the prior 10 days. But the one thing to note here is that the 10-day moving average is below the 50-day moving average, but it is coming up through the 50-day moving average. It is up for three days, so it's somewhat extended on this move, but that is constructive action. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise us to see us uh, pull back. How do you interpret this here, Dr. K? Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting how you, know, you look at so many charts over the years, and I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even look to see if this was a... Uh, if, if this was the highest volume day over the last 10 days, simply because it's not a proper price volume, it's not a proper price structure. Uh, in other words, the base is not done yet. It has to still do some work. So uh, until I see uh, a, you know, a little more time put into this uh, pattern, uh, I'm going to stay away from the stock. Yeah, I actually did pick up some MCP down uh, in this area down here. And uh, it's 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 acting okay. We'll see what it ends up doing. But I think the key here is that what you're really in right now is uh, this is a weekly chart here, and right now you're in a base that's one, two, three, four, five weeks long. So we might either look for it to set up in here. Maybe it, it takes some time to go sideways for a few days, and then you see a pocket pivot. But from this position, this is a tough one to buy. I mean, it looks. I, I like the action in terms of it just showing strength. And one of the things that I think is driving Mollycorp is that despite the fact that they announced 11.5 million share offering, that is what they filed for. I know some of the news uh, stories on it said a 10 million share offering, but they did file uh, for 11.5 million shares to be sold by selling shareholders. So those are the insiders, and everybody's been hearing about how Mollycorp is having the lockup period removed so that insiders can start selling. And, of course, that's what brought the stock in, I, I, I'm thinking here, along with the market coming in. And so everybody's thinking that the insiders are going to bail out and the stock's done. But in fact, what this offering does is it shows, number one, that instead of just willy-nilly selling into the open market by 144 sales, what the insiders have decided to do is to, to aggregate their shares and put them out in an offering so that it's a much more orderly distribution of the shares into the market, which I think is constructive for the stock in that you don't have this random flow of stock coming in and, and knocking its back as people exercise uh, their options and take stock out. In this case, you're going to complete the offering. Also, the size of the offering shows that selling shareholders, the insiders, are not selling all of their shares. So they, th this is taken as an indication that they still think there's upside in the stock. And I was on Fox News uh, last Tuesday, which actually would have been right here. And I told this claim in that I thought Molly Corp was viable down there as long as it held the 55 level. And that uh, at $9.44, $9.44 a share in 2013, the stock is selling at six, seven times forward earnings uh, over the next year. And I think that means it's certainly not overvalued and may actually be undervalued. Uh, also, news today that Vale. Uh, Everybody knows Vale SA, which is a, I, I believe that's a South American miner, uh, is going to be getting into rare earths as well uh, because they see that as a NASA market. And I think, uh, I'm not sure whether these guys really have anything going, but I think the fact that they're looking at moving into it, attracting uh, new producers, tells you that the market for rare earths is likely healthy and expected to remain so, uh, at least. Uh, at least uh, for the rarest uh, for now. So, 
this looks okay. So it's setting up, you know, so be patient. If it's going to have a big move, it's not going to happen in one week. And uh, this looks, so far this looks constructive, uh, a little bit news driven, but you could see some sort of a double bottom formation. Or we could come up the right side for a couple to handle. Uh, I'm remembering IGT, International Game Technology, way back in, I'm trying to remember when that was, uh, back when it had its first big move in the early 90s. But I remember it formed a short little six week uh, and kind of, kind of deep. Do you remember that one, Dr. K? It formed a cup yeah. and a handle and it was kind of narrow on the cup. And it yeah, no, I think, I think you're talking, uh, I think that was around the war, uh, right early or very early 91. Let's see if we can find it. And they had a huge, huge move. I don't know if they go back that far uh, on e-signal, but we're going to find out. Because, uh, I mean, yeah, there was a there was a nice move. I remember after, well, January 15th. I think that might be it. Is it? No. After the war in 91. That's right. Okay, let me keep yeah, going. Go to very, January 91, because that was right at the announcement of the war, and then IQT uh, came out yeah. of there pretty strongly, and, and then it went up something like 300%. Yeah, this is what it had. It had this kind of narrow, uh, it wasn't a short one, it was a narrow cup with a handle, came out, and then it had a big uh, big move after that. This is another one here, didn't have a really big move out of there. But you can get these kind of narrow things that form, and the stocks can continue higher. Uh, so I'd be looking for MCP potentially to form some kind of pattern like that, maybe a six-week uh, cup, seven-week cup with a little handle. Uh, so I think that looks interesting. Now, you know, I've liked the cloud computing group. We've recently seen uh, Salesforce.com had a Bible gap up. It has continued higher. Today tried to sell off and held up. Now, what you're noticing is that some of these cloud uh, stocks are starting to emerge from bases as the market's been going through this correction. So CRM has been counter-training the market uh, up until just recently where it was actually in sync with the market. But... Prior to that, before the gap up move, it was actually counter trading the market, which was moving lower, and it's actually holding up. Now, what it's trying to do now, it's trying to clear uh, this top here, this base here, and it's just running into a little resistance. But to me, it looks like it's okay. Maybe it needs to go sideways a little bit more. Maybe it just takes off. VMware is also in a cup with handle. The one thing I don't really like is this not really heavy volume, but this could go sideways and then break out. I would definitely watch for a breakout especially if a breakout uh, coincides with some sort of big follow-through day in the coming days, uh, because this could be a stock that moves higher. If you look at VMware, you know, it had a big, big run. Just kind of crunch this down to show the big run. And then you see that you have this base here where it tried to break out, and then it broke down and undercut on a closing basis, all the closing lows in here. So it comes here, and this kind of clears the decks. And, and sets things up, I think, for another move in the stock. And it kind of clears the decks after this big move because you have this and you have this to kind of give it some time to clean everybody out. you got some big selling over here, but notice how you get these three weeks of big selling that occur around the lows of this whole structure. If you want to take this whole structure going back to August, September of last year and just look at it kind of in total, you can see that when it did come down here, it closed mid-range all three of these weeks, and the volume is very heavy, so it was getting accumulation down here. And so this actually held as support the next time it tested. And I think that's constructive. So you have a cup and you have the handle. Notice you closed in the upper part of the range uh, the prior two weeks. Today, you're holding tight in here on the daily chart. You can see we held a nice tight range. Volume picked up a hair. I'd be watching for this to break out. But it is interesting that these are the two uh, big stock cloud computing plays that really got the whole thing going last year. And I would say, you know, off the 2009 lows, market lows as well, they, they've come all the way up over there. As we can see in this uh, weekly chart, here's March 2009, and we can see that, that uh, VMware bottomed well before March 2009, actually bottomed back in November, December of 2008, and it's gone continuously higher until you've seen it form these two bases. And this is a nice consolidation prior move. It, it could continue higher. I tend to like this uh, right now. It's definitely one I'm keeping my eye on. Okay. Now, another interesting development, as we know, VMware and Salesforce.com were both uh, stocks that were the big stock cloud computing leaders. And we were looking at them as some of the first ones last year, and then we saw some other ones come on, like... Uh, Riverbed Technologies, Aruba Networks, Cavium Networks, and 
uh, NetSuite. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them that started to come on after these three did. And the third one of the big stock cloud computing uh, companies is uh, F5. And I know I've been talking about F5 as a short. In fact, you know, some of you played it pretty well on this breakdown off the 50-day moving average when we first started uh, mentioning this. And the stock broke down a fair bit, uh, went through the 200-day moving average. Now, the thing about head and shoulders patterns, remember we thought this was a left shoulder, a head, a right shoulder, and here's your neckline. Okay, so you got this neckline here, and you think it's going to break, but it doesn't. Now, there's actually a precedent for stock looking like this, like it's going to break down in the head and shoulders and then turning around and rallying to new highs. And that precedent is Priceline. If you go back here, let's go back. Here's the Priceline right now. This is a weekly chart of Priceline. But if you go back and you look at the pattern back during uh, the summer correction last year, uh, Priceline actually had this big breakdown on heavy volume. So that's your classic right side of the head type of formation where you see a breakdown off the peak occurring on a lot of volume like this. You have a left shoulder here. You have a, a head right here. There's the right side of the head. And then you form these two little shoulders. And I remember at the time I was watching for this to break to go short Priceline. And then Priceline turned around at that point. Let's go back to the, uh, to this, back, to the base back then. And this is... You know, it's what looking like on a daily chart back then. Hope I don't lose you all here. But you see, there's the left shoulder, there's the head, and there's the two little right shoulders. This is on a daily chart now. Remember, we're just looking at the weekly chart, and this is what it looked like on a daily. But then you had pocket pivots coming up through the 50-day moving average here, and then uh, two days later, a pocket pivot coming up through the 200-day moving average back there. And at the time, I remember thinking, this thing's going to turn around and go higher. And then you had a viable gap up on earnings right here. Uh, at the end of July, and the stock hasn't looked back since. Okay, so when I'm looking at F5 now, and remember, the, the market is always about possibilities. It's not about absolutes. So there's no guarantee that F5 is going to go higher from here. But there are a few things that I can postulate. In other words, I can come in here and say, well, knowing historical precedent and how big leaders have acted in the past, when they don't follow through with the head and shoulders top and actually top and go lower, in fact, what happens is the head and shoulders gets negated as the stock, instead of rolling over on the right shoulder, starts to show some positive action. And so what you had on Friday was a pocket pivot up through the 200-day moving average, breaking out of this range here, which was a little flag formation coming off of this low. This gap up occurred on earnings. Stock came back and, and closed the gap, uh, rallied back up, found some resistance. I was actually shorting this thing in here, and I got blown out of it and stopped out very quickly. Uh, thankfully, because this thing is continuing higher and gapped up uh, above 114 uh, this morning. And so I think this has the potential to go higher, okay? And the one thing I want to point out is that you could use the 200 day as your guide for a stop, maybe give yourself another 2 or 3 or 4%, depending on your risk tolerance. But what I would watch for here is the potential for, uh, let me, let me, I'm going to make this a little tighter, a little fatter. There we go. So now you can see it. But you see this big, you have a big run, and now here you're forming this pattern. It's not, not really panning out as a head and shoulders, even though it looks like it here. But it's now starting to look like it wants to round out. And some of you may be aware of, uh, who've read our book, uh, Trade Like an O'Neill Disciple, where I talk about the punch bowl of death formation. And a lot of times you can trade the punch bullet death formation on the upside. So let's say maybe we're looking at a market top further out, several months. So maybe the market follows through here. F5, in my view, could, could potentially move rapidly towards the 140 level, towards the old highs, providing you with a trading opportunity from here to there on the basis that it should hold the 200-day moving average. Okay, is everybody with me on that? Uh, so that's something I would be watching for. And, of course, the market, the general market action sort of overrides everything. That is the tide. When you're swimming against the tide, it's more difficult to make things work or things have a lower probability of working. But when you're swimming with the tide, then some of the things uh, that you'll see that even can be, you know, a stock building, a big punch bowl of death formation here, it still could provide a trading opportunity. And what I would like to point out here is back 
uh, what we saw uh, when I was looking at dry ships, and I remember way back here in 2008, there's a pocket pivot tight move up through here, and you actually could have traded this from here to here uh, using the precedent, uh, get this, of Reading Railroad from, I think, 1907, which had the same exact kind of pattern. So this turned into a pod, and, and then it broke down and was a short. But you actually could have traded this move understanding that this had the potential to form a pod and uh, create a tradable move from, from either the 50-day or 200-day up to uh, the 110 area. And those are pretty decent moves. You know, 20, 30, 40 percent move in a stock if you pyramid it properly and use leverage properly. Uh, it can add uh, some juice to your account in terms of performance. So these are things to be open to and just kind of watch and see how they develop. It's going to depend on where the general market goes. Okay? So that's something to think about. So what I'd like you to do is just kind of stew on this dry ships uh, pattern right here for just a second. Okay, and now that you've all had an opportunity to meditate on that, we want to go here and we want to see this pattern as potentially uh, being similar to dry ships with the potential to rally up I'd say anywhere from 130 to 140 as a trade, okay, and then maybe it hits the top and uh, this becomes a pot and it breaks down. I don't know, but what it looks like right now on the basis of this pocket pivot is that it has the potential to go higher. So, Dr. K, you got anything to throw uh, as a sort of devil's advocate here? Well, I, actually, I've been uh, looking through uh, my screens while you've been speaking, and uh, I'm going to be uh, launching a report before uh, this webinar is over that the model has indeed turned into a, to a neutral signal. Uh, so we're in a neutral final. signal, okay. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, in, we're in a neutral right now, and uh, basically, well, I, I'm writing the report, it's, uh, so I'm going to launch this right before um, we're done. Okay, so you guys, you get it here first. Uh, the model has switched to a neutral signal. Um, so, so anyway, so that's what I'm looking at with uh, F5, and we can just kind of run through some other interesting stocks. Uh, I, IG, uh, IPG Photonics, interesting situation, had a pocket pivot three days ago. Uh, kind of a thinner stock. Uh, one stock that I saw today that I thought was kind of interesting, uh, this is Colombian Oil, um, and the name of the company is uh, Echo Petrol. Uh, out of Colombia, it had a pocket pivot move coming up to the 44 level. Uh, it's a thin stock, trades about 300,000 shares a day, so normally would not be something I would be looking at, but if you've got a smaller account, this might be an interesting move to play if you see a pullback in here. Uh, some of these other things, I'm watching Cavium Networks is moving sideways. It's a very volatile, choppy stock, but I'm just keeping an eye on that. Fortinet, uh, which I've liked, and I was on Fox last week uh, telling people to keep an eye on this one. Uh, just missed by a day of pocket pivot. Uh, ten days ago is here. Was not higher than that volume ten days ago. But it's holding up pretty nicely. And if you look at it on a weekly chart, let's thin it down, put it on a diet here. You're actually in a one, two, three, four, five week base. Now you got support on this week, which was high volume. You closed well in the upper part of the range here. Okay? And that doesn't look too bad. You know, so if you've got some kind of a breakout here, you could buy it or a pocket pivot. Uh, if you're really daring and the market turns with a follow-through, then you could actually come in here and buy that uh, outright, just right there. Uh, here you have Tipco Software, which is a story I like on the basis of the fact that it uh, provides social media integration software for businesses. Uh, Tipco actually was working with... Uh, Several uh, companies, Accenture is one of them as a partner, and that's going to broaden their exposure on Accenture's platform uh, in terms of offering their software. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, I would look more into that company. They've got some interesting videos on their website uh, for Tibco. So let me just kind of meander through my list here. Some of the things are acting strong. Here's a headache stock, uh, OVTI. You know, breaks down real hard and rallies right back. So uh, hard to own hard to hold on to, uh, and it doesn't really treat you very well. It likes to slap you around if you're long this thing. We've been watching this one, Sequence Communications. This is an IPO. Uh, this is a gap up here. There was a viable gap up, but we didn't feel uh, it was kind of a cheap stock. We weren't really sure about that at the time. Uh, in hindsight, we wish we had mentioned it because yeah, actually, that's, 
this is an interesting one because it, this reminds me of uh, in the late 90s, you had stocks that had these big moves, but you could step in and buy them because there were enough stocks that were working. Uh, I remember on the day that, uh, that first day, it, it gapped up, uh, and it finished the day up uh, nearly 30%. And in this kind of market environment, while the story of, of uh, this company is very compelling, it's not the kind of market environment where I feel very secure buying a stock that's up 30% on the day. Um, and so, you know, the, the decision was made just, yeah, let's just, let's see where it goes. And what I like about this stock is the story behind it and that it will base at some point, it could be like an MCP where it then forms a fairly deep base, but then issues a pocket pivot, which would be a lot easier to buy because you know where your uh, exit point is. Whereas if, if you're buying uh, SQ and S, uh, you know, where it closed, uh, and you're using the gap up rule. I mean, it, it it's going to fall a good. Uh, how, how much is that? It's like maybe ten percent. Twenty percent. I mean, that range is uh, on that. Well, about fifteen percent. That's a pretty deep range. Yeah. So that's it's again in this kind of margin environment. I don't feel really very comfortable putting that much risk on a trade. But we do think this is a name you need to keep an eye on because this is initial strength, and what you may end up having is some sort of a base that forms later on. You know, on stocks like MCP showed initial strength and then they form bases that could have been bought into so there's always plenty of time you're not going to necessarily catch this here because there isn't a coherent uh, spot or an optimal spot to be buying off of uh, but you know in, in this case you know you just got to watch this one and see where it goes from here and where it provides an optimal base but I would say this initial strength after coming public the story make this one you want to have on your watch list we'll be watching it of course and if there's a pocket pivot uh, you guys will be the first ones uh, to know, hopefully. Uh, I don't see who else is going to know before that. Uh, but anyways, let's go I'll keep going through some of these. I'll uh, I'll take some uh, questions here, see what people are saying. Oh, yeah, Somebody's there's asking... a couple uh, questions, actually, um, uh, pre-questions, pre-webinar questions from members. Um, like, there's a, a real quick one about uh, um, when, what's your view on the length of time it takes for resistance to fade away. So in other words, um, how many? they want to know how many years is still relevant. So if a stock, say, formed the left side of a, of a cup, uh, if that left side is generally more than 12 to 18 months old, it, it doesn't really have much resistance left in it. In other words, it's pretty much faded out. Um, I found that 18 months is, is definitely a, a nice cutoff point. Uh, where after 18 months, you, you can just assume that uh, that that the chart didn't even exist. Uh, yeah, well, you can see are roughly the, uh, the 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 region of cutoff. Right. So if someone's asking you how long, where where does resistance come into play? Let's use an example like Amazon. Okay, and I'm and this chart is a weekly chart extending all the way back to when it came uh, public uh, back in the late 90s, and you can see you have the run up here. And this is a multi-year cup with handle, and as it tried to come up to the highs, it did see some resistance. But we don't really think of that as being that relevant because uh, it's it's not. It can get through that pretty quickly. Like for example, look at here. You have another cup. This resistance doesn't really hold very long at all. So you can't really make any assumptions uh, about that at all. We would simply interpret the action in terms of the more recent uh, base action. And as Dr. K said, anything longer than 18 months, there's pretty much no overhead. Uh, supply are, are definitely not enough to uh, be a problem, but I wouldn't really focus on anything like that. I just watch the stock and see how it acts because you can just psych yourself out if you think you see uh, resistance uh, from overhead uh, many years ago, and that keeps you from the stock. Um, I would ask anybody who has questions about the book or anything to please uh, email us that. That's, that's a better. Uh, Place to go, but you know we're basically saying pocket pivot rules may change over time. Everything evolves, and so as as, as Dr. K continues his research, the rules for pocket pivots could change at some point. But that doesn't mean they're changing today. Okay. Anyway, so that that's basically how you feel about that. Some questions people have uh, and asked us about you know LVS is LVS still a short? Well, how do I know? I, all I know is that. For, it's definitely come down from where we first started talking about it. It's underneath its 200-day moving average. Uh, I can't tell you whether it's going lower from here. If the market continues higher, it may simply drag the stock up and it'll drift higher. 
If you wanted to short it here because you think it's shortable, then what you would probably want to do is use the 200 day moving average as your reference for a stop. It certainly couldn't get above it today, uh, and it's possible that it could break down. Now, let's say the market weakens, you don't get a follow through. Well, then this might become uh, very shortable, but it, it's still it's in a shortable position. Whether you want to short it is going to be dependent on the general market, I tend to think. Uh, whether I can tell you uh, whether or not it's going down from here or not for sure, uh, buy me a crystal ball and maybe I can tell you. Otherwise, I don't think I really can. So, uh, CMG is another stock. You, know, you had a pocket pivot in here. Stock moves higher, breaks out. No volume on the breakout, which of course makes it suspect. So you get a pullback here. You know, it's just doing what it does right now. Uh, not a lot of volume on a breakout, so of course that's a riskier thing to be buying into. My take is I wouldn't be messing around with this right now. If I bought the pocket pivot, I made some money. Maybe I trade it, or maybe I just hold it and see if it holds the top of this formation here. But that's the stock we've been following uh, for a while. You know, some people are asking us about other names like Agro. Looks like Cisco. Yeah, but it's it's a foreign company. It's not Cisco Systems. It's a, a thin trader. Not anything like Cisco Systems at the time, uh, but it does have a, It does look like Cisco back when Cisco uh, came public way back. Let's see if we can do that. Let's get back over there. Let's go all the way back. Have a little fun here. Go back to 1991. Now everybody saw what that aggro chart looks like. I will. I will give you uh, credit, George, for uh, pointing that out. That was looking like Cisco. You know your charts. I'm impressed. Uh, you know your historical charts, but let's go all the way back. That's hopefully it's going to take a little while. But this, I think, this is while, I, while you're doing that. Um, there was a there was a question about pyramiding that I can answer. Uh, it, it's essentially going long or short based on the market direction model, and uh, pyramiding or not pyramiding. Um, essentially, my view is that everybody's got to find what what works best for their style their risk tolerance levels. I personally like to allocate a certain percentage uh, to a buy signal or sell signal with the respective ETF. Uh, and my favorite ETFs are uh, the TNA, TZA pair. They're three times ETFs that mirror uh, three times the movement of the Russell 2000. And so on a buy signal, uh, they tend to move up the most. And on a sell signal, they tend to move down the most. So um, if you're less... Um, uh, risk, uh, if you're more risk averse, rather, then you could try the one times version of the Russell 2000, uh, which I think is IWM and then its uh, inverse uh, counterpart. But uh, essentially, if you want to reproduce the results that you see on the website, then that those results are based on going all in on a buy signal or all in all in to the inverse component on a sell signal, and uh, or rather, uh, it's the short of the TNA. So in other words, uh, going long TNA or going short TNA, that would apply to the Qs, that would apply to any ETF. So if you can get the borrow, that's fine. If you can't get the borrow, then just buy the three times inverse ETF. Um, now, if you want to be more conservative, and in other words, if you if the model has a buy signal and you don't trust it, you could buy, you could allocate a fraction of your full position to that buy signal, and then if it moves higher and hits a certain price point, then you can add to that position accordingly. Of course, that that's a way that's more conservative, and you won't get the kind of returns that you see on the website. But it is a more conservative approach, and your drawdowns will will be uh, will be less. I'm glad you took up all that time because I think I'm going to blow e-signal up right here trying to find this chart. Ah, you're on 93 still. <laughs> That's a, that's a lot of uh, mouse yeah, clicks. I'm still going back. It's still got the data. Well, there, there's actually one other question. Um, uh, that question was, uh, it's a good question. It, they wanted us to talk about how we go about uh, our screens uh, in, selecting, in selecting stocks. Uh, because they, are, they have a problem in that they see hundreds of good stocks to buy. Uh, so they're wondering how we select the best. And while well, the answer there is, first of all, um, we're screening for uh, liquidity. In other words, there has to be a certain average uh, daily dollar volume that the stock trades. Uh, in, in better market environments, I'll relax the minimum to maybe as low as 15 or 20 million. Um, 
average daily dollar volume. In this kind of market environment, I, I'm more comfortable having the minimum at 25 million. I think Gill actually uses even a higher minimum than that. Um, and then the price point, the price of the stock should be generally 12 to 15 dollars or more. Uh, the relative strength on the stock, generally I'm looking for 90 and above. Not always, you know, there could be other variables that measure up and then I might find myself buying a stock that has a relative strength of 85, for instance. And if you, if you get a service that has composite rating, I like to see composite rating generally at least, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the low, low to high 90s. Okay. Uh, um, okay, so. That, you know, I don't know if you want to add any in terms of screening mechanisms, but th those are the basics. You want a stock to be liquid and uh, you want the fundamentals to be strong. The composite rating certainly takes care of that. If you don't have that, you, could, you should see earnings percentage increases uh, or acceleration going back over the last few quarters uh, and, and uh, revenue percentage increases as well. Generally a minimum I'd say of 20 to 25 percent quarter to quarter. And here's, I think this is uh, the pattern. Cisco, when it came public, uh, broke out. You can see that it, it came public in uh, 1990 and then in late 90, uh, 1990 it actually broke out after this big shakeout. And I want you to keep that imprinted on your brain there and we'll go, go look at agro right now. Uh, you know, there's some similarities, but really when you study them, they're not really that similar. The other thing is that Cisco at the time was bringing uh, new technology. You know, that Cisco was actually started at my alma mater, Stanford University, by professors who were just trying to uh, set up their computers on campus in different locations so that they could talk to each other. So they created the router and uh, they created Cisco Systems, which then became a public company. And of course, we know it today is one of the biggest tech companies on the planet and a big Dow stock these days now, which usually tells you when a stock is in decline, they put it in the Dow. But you know, think about it. This company, Agro, Luxembourgian provider of farming crops, agricultural products, cattle, dairy, sugar, ethanol, and energy pro production. Crops include soybean, corn, wheat, sunflower, and cotton. That doesn't sound like Cisco to me. There isn't some groundbreaking new product uh, you know, like what Cisco had because basically Cisco's uh, network network products or networking hardware products are what brought the internet to life and enabled the internet. So this major enabling technology, when you're looking at charts, one chart does not mean, you know, one, the look of one chart doesn't mean another one that looks the same is going to work the same way. And I would say even more so if they have nothing to do with each other in terms of being innovative new companies with the groundbreaking, cutting edge new products that can drive a whole new sector uh, in terms of economic growth like we've seen with the internet. Okay, so Agro, you know, Luxembourgian farming dairy company, not Cisco. Okay, so that's a long answer, but George, I want to thank you for bringing that up because I think that's very instructive, and I am very impressed that you uh, remember that Cisco chart from uh, 1990. So, when do you f uh, when do you switch to 2013 versus 2012 EPS? Well, I look at I'm just looking at MCP Molly Corp's earnings in 2013 as being nine dollars and forty four cents. In 2012, uh, I think the stock is expected to have something like uh, three dollars, uh, I believe. And the next quarter, you're going to see a big jump uh, of uh, let's see, that's, where are we? 564 percent increase uh, over the next couple of quarters. 65 cents, 45 cents, 65 cents, 67 cents. So you're really starting to see some material increases in earnings. You're looking at three dollars and seventy cents for 2012. But my point, simply in bringing that up, is when you look at the forward earnings of Molly Corp down the line, right now you cannot make an argument that the stock is expensive. Okay, so despite the fact that a lot of people want to say that Molly Corp has had a huge move and it's probably over, uh, we don't necessarily believe that's the case. We think this thing has more in it, so we're interested in keeping an eye on it for now. Um, I want to get through some other stocks here. Acme Packet uh, is another one of these hardware plays in cloud computing. If F5 is coming back to life, maybe this one does too. And you notice it's pulled back one, two, three times, has failed to break. So the rule of three might tell you that this thing's ready to come out of here. That's a possibility. I'd keep an eye on that one as well. Riverbed Technologies, you know, some people want to see a, a shoulder, left shoulder, a head and a right shoulder. And I guess if you squint a lot, that's what it looks like. But there's one key 
characteristic about this pattern that I think does not make it a head and shoulders top. It could be another type of a top, a late stage failed basis. I mean, you don't really see a major volume price break on the right side of the head. There's no massive volume break off the peak. It just comes down with the market. And given that it's had this big move since breaking out back when this bull run started back in uh, late August, early September, uh, it's entitled to build a longer base. And this, I think, actually does a lot of constructive work in terms of, number one, undercutting this prior low, which is from January of this year. So I'm pointing at it right here with the arrow. And then you undercut it here and bounce off the 40-week or the 200-day moving average. And now you're trying to work your way up. Now look at the selling volume here on the weekly chart. Right here, when you test the 40-week line right here, your volume dries up. And again, last week you tried to come down, you found support at the 10-week line or the 50-day. That's the blue line I have here. And you'll notice that volume started to dry up. Now you're kind of moving sideways here. This stock could be setting up to come out again. And if we have a follow-through in the market, then I think this may come out. And, of course, this would coincide with F5, which is a little bit on the networking side, as well as APKT. Aruba Networks. Uh, the one thing I don't like about Aruba Networks is this massive break. Now, that's that's a massive break off the peak. On the weekly chart, that's what it looks like. Okay, So that, that kind of looks like a left shoulder and a head. So I think this is your weaker play. Now, is it a short here? Well, you could say it is because let's, let's draw some lines here. Um, you could see this as being uh, a type of uh, resistance. You know, you can see these just kind of connect all these lows roughly, and you rally back up into it. And you see the 10-day line, which is the magenta line here, coming down. Found some resistance there. Uh, I actually shorted a little bit. I think I made a whole dime on the position for the day, but I covered it by the end of the day, just trying to get a feel to see if it's weak. Uh, but I don't have it anymore. Maybe it rolls over. I think that's going to depend on the general market. And the, the other thing to keep in mind here is, yeah, this may be resistance here, but it is not a thick area of resistance. You might find a thicker area of resistance around the $30 price level here, okay, up here, or you may just see it come all the way up in here to the 50-day uh, moving average first. Here's a 65-day, the black line, which coincides with this area of resistance. Would I short it? It's going to really depend on what the general market does. It's one I'm keeping an eye on simply because if this is the right side of a head, this could be a right shoulder, and it could retest that low. So that's something uh, that I'm watching for. But it's viable. It's just not really clear right now. Now, And if we did think it was viable, we would probably put it up as a short sale setup email uh, and send it out to you guys. Let's see. Let's get some more questions in here. Uh, when the model goes neutral, what does that mean? That means it's neither a buy or a sell. You just go to cash. Right, Dr. K? Yep, so if you have any ETFs left over from the prior signal, you should just sell them out, or that is the guidance that, that we offer, is just to go to cash as it, it, as concerns ETFs. Now, you might have stocks in your portfolio, but that's a totally different uh, situation. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking, what is the basis for uh, buying MCP? Well, I was coming down in here, made a low right on top of this base, so I see 55 as ultimate support here, and then it retests in a light volume. It was not heavy selling down here, and usually on a retest, you have a low, and then it runs up, bounces, pulls back, tests it, but never actually gets there. The volume dries up. That's a constructive retest. Sometimes you can buy into those using the low of the uh, initial low here, so just above 55 is a potential stop. So, But at this point, it's kind of hard to figure out uh, where the stock is, so I've traded and sold it, and I'll see what happens. Uh, going forward, if it sets up again, so I've made a little money on it, not you know anything to write home about, but I'm kind of getting a feeling for the stock down here. It does have support. My guess is you would have to back and fill and and find some sort of uh, or see some sort of a retest. That's just my my uh, kind of instincts on this one, just seeing how how most bases tend to play out. Um, some other that's stocks. That's an interesting example of trading personality, by the way, because uh, Gil's trading personality is that he. I think he tends to prefer buying on weakness, and I tend I tend to generally buy on strength. I rarely will buy on weakness, uh, but both this, both methods methods work, and they work simply because uh, they're geared toward our individual trading personalities. So if you know how to buy on weakness properly, or you know how to buy on strength properly, over <clears> time you're going to come out ahead. Yeah, and I think also in some environments, one uh, technique versus the other might work a little bit better. I actually think in this environment you're better off. 
taking your initial position at an optimal point of pocket pivot and then buying into strength at certain intervals that put you in a position where your average cost is sufficient, sufficiently low that your profit uh, cushion is sufficiently high so that you can sit through a lot of this volatility. I think that is uh, the case. So somebody's asking about how does a split affect price action. I, sometimes the stock splits and it goes up, sometimes it goes down. Uh, I would actually read Bill O'Neill's book, How to Make Money Selling yeah, Stock. I've, I've done some studies on that. Uh, um, if, if you're in a bull market and you're in a good stock, well, the stock is naturally good because the price is going higher and therefore it causes the split. Usually, usually the first couple of times it splits is a bullish sign and the stock will rally the first couple of times. Now, if the stock has made some really good moves in the bull cycle and it's splitting a third time or fourth time, what what I've noticed is that if the split is more than, say, two to one, let's say it's a three to one split uh, or hot, or even more, that often could be a sign that the stock has exhausted its run, and that could be the sign of a potential top. But then you have to have the price volume action confirm that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get back to MCP, and uh, somebody was asking uh, whether the composite rating of 53 is a factor. And I would say, in this case, you make an exception. So you don't do everything by the book. We understand that Molly Corp and the rare earths phenomenon is not going to be based on current earnings. It's it's something that's really on the come, similar to the internet names in the late 90s, which we played, and a lot of these didn't have any earnings, but they had some incredible uh, runs based on the, the, just the whole internet concept, and in some cases, some very strong sales growth. So what we know with Molly Corp is that the estimates, in this case, override the current fundamental situation that gives the stock a composite rating of 53. So we make an exception in this case and uh, it just shows how if you're just going to do everything by the book, you can, but some of the most rewarding trades that I've had uh, have been done in stocks where you don't see those classic uh, by the book numbers. And I think in this case, uh, if you were so fixated on Molly Corp's uh, composite rating or the current earnings, which I actually find that estimates are something to screen on uh, if you want to. But I just, as I go through my names that I'm looking through, uh, that come out through my screens every week or every day, uh, I'm kind of trying to understand what is the forward story here, where are the estimates, because the thing is, what's different about the markets today relative to 10 years ago and even more so relative to 10 years before that and 10 years before that, is that there's a lot of information out there and people have a lot more access to a lot of information. So what is current is in many cases old news. And I think a lot of stocks, uh, if you have the confirming uh, estimates uh, going forward that show huge growth, a lot of times that can override what's going on. So yeah, there are exceptions, but there's no way for me to put that in some definition that you can plug in somewhere and come up with a mindless answer. You've got to do some thinking uh, and, and kind of try and work your way through it. But a lot of this is uh, a function of developing your judgment over time, and that comes with experience, and hopefully some of that you pick up from what we're talking about here. So, you know, we got some ideas we're looking at on the long side. We don't think there's a big rush here. Uh, Green Mountain Coffee broke out of this pattern, added to the NASDAQ 200. This is a nice 3 w, 3WT or three weeks tight formation. Stock's holding the gains, uh, but it's up there, so you can't buy it, but it's acting okay. You had heavy volume today, but the stock closed mid range, so just looks to me like it's consolidating the move. You know, if it started to break down and fail, uh, Dr. K, would you use the 10-day moving average as your guide for a stop on this now, on Green Mountain? Well, I I would generally, you know, it's had the gap up. It's looking great on the chart. I would, uh, well, in a, in a sell signal environment, and we're not in that anymore. We're now neutral. In a sell signal environment, I'd use a 10-day. In a neutral or buy signal environment, it depends. It really depends on how the pattern traces out in the days ahead. Uh, so it would be a judgment call. But it shows that uh, Green Mountain has not violated its 10-day moving average, it appears, uh, since at least somewhere in here back in late February. So we have been more than seven weeks uh, now where you've, you have not seen a violation. These are, these are closes below, but it never actually moves lower than the intraday low of each of these first closes. So it never violated. So you, would, you wouldn't use the 10-day right now. Well, see, it's, the thing is, it, it's had two gap ups, and that kind of resets the, resets the pattern. Uh, 
So you can't you you can be more conservative and say, okay, I'm going to keep my profits and uh, use the 10 day if it violates it because of that uh, that seven week rule. Uh -huh. But if you if you are in a stronger market environment, let's say for some reason the market just starts to take off again, and uh, you believe that this is a leader, then you don't necessarily want to get whipped out of the position just because it violates the 10 day. But it would be it'd be really subject to general conditions and also how this pattern traces out. I see. Okay. And also the well, other thing, the market can have some momentary weakness and that can cause a stock like this to violate the 10 day. Uh, you know, since it had its gap up, it could violate the 10 day, but that, and again, you might not want to sell it just because it does that, especially if the volume is, you know, the, the considerations of low volume, constructive pullback, all, all those criteria, it's just because the market has a, has a moment's weakness. Okay. So it really kind of depends on where you bought it. And if you bought it here, you might want to keep it tighter stuff than if you bought it here. Uh, let's right. see. Uh, last question, I think, we'll go with Tzu is one. Uh, you know, don't have too much to say about SodaStream, SODA. Someone's asking us about that. Uh, it just broke out of this kind of loose base, and it's continuing higher. So it's not acting badly, but I generally don't traffic in that stock. It's been kind of erratic. Uh, but doesn't look too bad. It's got good numbers, so you know if you bought the breakout, it's acting okay. Uh, travel to uh, pocket pivot volume signature. Is that a pocket pivot or not, Doctor K? Well, uh, it is technically a pocket pivot. I, I'm not comfortable how it it was a mid bar close, close right. and you know especially with such a strong market, market to me. You know, and on the other hand, it had a gap up on uh, April 21st, my birthday. Um, so that's a nice little. Uh, uh, Positive action in the pattern, but uh, I don't know. It's very. It's, it seems uh, to me that if you were going to play today's pocket pivot, you you go in with a half position at most. Uh, I, yeah. I don't feel that comfortable with with where it closed. Yeah, I wasn't really either. So I mean, we saw you know a couple others in there. Um, Radware had a kind of a pocket pivot today. Uh, you know that that may be something to look at. It's a thinner stock, trades a couple hundred thousand shares a day. It's a cloud stock, but it's starting to uh, come out. And that was a pocket pivot. That may be a little bit better, uh, but it's a very thin stock, a lot like EC. Uh, Fossil is one that's actually pretty well. That actually looks okay. It's holding the gap up. So if you know if you had a six percent downside stop, you could actually buy this gap up here. Which is a viable gap up, and it's held below. It had a little bit of a drop below here intraday, but it closed above, and now it looks like it's setting up and wanting to go higher. And notice how it's holding up in a three weeks uh, flag here, uh, not three weeks tight, but you got two tight closes right here. But of course, you're only one day into this week, so you have to see how it closes. But nothing wrong with Fossil; uh, it's acting fine. Uh, somebody's asking me, did I write a couple of cartoon books? Uh, in fact, I did. In fact, I've written two, or rather published two cartoon collections from my early 20s back when I was a cartoonist. And I also have two uh, books on the markets, uh, Trade Like an O'Neill Disciple, which I wrote with uh, the illustrious Dr. K, and uh, How to Make Money Selling Stocks Short, which I wrote with uh, Bill O'Neill. So, yes, yeah, so I may be one of the only people on the planet, maybe the only one on the planet, who's actually published books uh, that are cartoon collections of my artwork along with books on uh, the financial markets. So, uh, you know, we, Dr. K and I both like to think of ourselves as very diverse individuals. Some of our friends may just tell you we're eccentric and bizarre, and maybe that's true also, but it hasn't hurt us in the markets most of the time. So, uh, on that note, you know, there are some things we've shown you a couple of things we're looking at right now in the market. There aren't a lot of things. Uh, that really look right, but it doesn't mean that some things can start coming out of bases. And of course, we'll keep you posted with pocket pivots. Somebody is asking me to talk about uh, the punch bowl of death formation, and I think what I'll do for you guys is I'm going to put together a, a short GoView.com video about uh, punch bowl of death formations, uh, so that you can see uh, what the formation looks like and how you would apply it. Okay, and I know a lot of people misinterpret it. Uh, it tends to be a short pattern, but I'll, I'll do a special video, GoView video, uh, for you guys, and uh, and you guys can take a look at that, and that'll give you better an idea of what a pod is. Uh, we've gone for an hour and just about 15 minutes. I think we're done for today. Any other questions, please email us, uh, and watch for my uh, GoView webinar on pods. Okay, you guys? Uh,
nice to talk to you today, and I hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend, and we'll see how the trading week goes. Take care. So long.